that car almost rolled it. Yeah, he did about everything he could do to get that car down the race course. But I'll tell you, I was impressed with Paul Romine. He had problems too and did a very, very good job, job of driving the car. Backpedaled it, jumped on the brakes real good, jumped back in the throttle and was able to salvage the run. The motor hurt a little bit. You see the smoke coming off of it. That can be fixed. I wasn't trying to be a prophet when I said too much horsepower could be a disadvantage, but I think maybe it really was here for Joe Amato. Look, wheels up start by Joe Amato and both cars. Romine's already lifted, now Amato gets into trouble. Romine's back in the throttle, and look, his car's hooked. And there he goes, right on by Joe, who's still trying to gain control. Then Joe backfired and exploded the motor. And that's what happens, Steve, every now and then when you back in and out of the throttles. Watch it from the finish line. You'll see this car in a minute on the back pedal. Every time you see the flames go up, now he's going to back pedal now, you're going to see a bang. There you go, right there. A huge supercharger explosion. That's why he couldn't get back in the throttle. Fascinating drag racing. Unbelievable. The driver is back in these cars on this racetrack today. The crew chief is really critical as well. This is going to take a team effort between the driver and the crew chief to win this race. It certainly is. And I'll tell you, you know, the, the, the fuel cars have so much more traction on the rear wheels than the funny cars do. It's going to be interesting what happens when we get into the funny car. But right now, we got the uh, Gary Selzy, the points leader in the Winston Points Chase, in the Winston uh, car against Shelly Anderson. Let's take a look down at the far end. There is Amato's car, and it is one wounded baby. There'll be a new aluminum lamp in those frame rails before it races again. You notice, look at the supercharger. It's kind of sitting on a cocked angle. Okay, Bob Unkevert. Well, we got the supercharger a little cocked. We've got a fuel line blown off the back of the left head down here. The blower belt's off. Not only what is it a ride, but he also uh, sacrificed a little aluminum to the gods. We'll try and get Joe in a minute. The guys from ESPN have got him right now, but... Hey, we'll see what happens, but you can see right here on the camera that uh, got some problems down here on the big end. Oh, get aggressive. Knock him down. That was Alan Johns with a thumbs up to Gary Selzy up against defending Pennzoil Nationalist champion Shelley Anderson. Number one against number 16 should be a great race. Shelley left and then just went out and parked it and got back on the gas again. And look at Selzy, Alan Johnson have a handle on this car in this racetrack. 467 at 311 miles an hour when nobody else can go down. He had a 519 reaction time, which is not the world's greatest, and I'm sure he'll beat himself up a little bit about that. But uh, the victory is his. He's in the winner's circle, and that's all that really matters. At the eighth of a mile, Selzy was running 262 miles an hour at half track in 3.15 seconds. That car ran 262. That's even more impressive than the 311 at 467. Yes, it is. 49 mile an hour gain in the last half of the racetrack. That's pretty substantial for a fuel car. Well, there's Corey Mack. Corey McLanathan for Joe Gibbs. Team McDonald's. Joe Gibbs is actually here today. Boy, what a great job of qualifying he did with that 465. The car left the starting line, and he backpedaled and jumped back in it just perfect, and it set the front end down. It was the prettiest thing you'd ever want to see. And Eddie Hill. Eddie and Ursi Hill, Dan Olson, now the crew chief on this automobile, and he's got some pretty good help to go along with him. He certainly does. You know, uh, they thought they'd really found their problems. They'd found an exposed mag wire that was going through the firewall. Actually, it was between the firewall and the frame, and they thought that, that was the problem. And guess what? I did, too, because the first couple of runs, it worked just fine running a 480 to qualify. Then all of a sudden, the trouble set back in, so Eddie has still not got it all figured out. Shelly Anderson, the defending champion, goes out in round number one to one amazing race car. Hey, Unc, you got Gary Selzy? Gary Selzy, 467, 311, man, you guys are flying and hooking on this racetrack. Well, what can I say? Alan Johnson, he knows his department in that clutch, I'll tell you. Driver's not doing a bad job out there either, though. Oh, I don't know. The driver's a weak link here. Thank God for Alan. It's uh, going to be a tough race today, though. Yeah, it is. You know, it's anybody's ball game. When the track con condition's changing, the weather, we don't know. It's all a crapshoot. You heard what he said. Driver's the weak link. He's going to beat himself up over that reaction time on the starting line. He'll go back and practice and sit there and get his mind game straight. Well, reaction time has always been Selzy's strong suit. Even when he was in the Federal Mogul cars and early this year, he won on hole shots. Had a fabulous reaction time against Kenny Bernstein in the final round of the Phoenix race, the second race of the year. But he still hasn't had a lot of runs in a fuel car to get the consistency uh, that it takes to become a professional fuel racer. But it will happen as long as you have Alan Johnson at the controls. Well, no one loves this racetrack any more than Shelly Anderson. Unfortunately, she will uh, not see it again in 97. She's with Bob Unkerford. 
Shelly, you got Alpha on him, and all of a sudden the car seemed to slow down a little bit, well, and then back into it. What happened? It shook. It was going to smoke tires. I pedaled it, got back on it, and he drove around me. You know, um, I clicked it before the lights. As soon as he crossed the finish line, I clicked it, and that's race. And hopefully the Parts America Texaco Haviland car will do better next week in Dallas because we sure did not do good here. We were hoping for doing well after winning last year, and we did really bad. Still chasing some new car blues? I don't know if that's the excuse or not. Maybe we're just lost. I don't know. Thanks. Tough day at the digs. Lost, boy. I, lo, lost, boy. I'll tell you, that is so easy to do in this form of motorsport. Drag racing, there are just so many things against you. I mean, the track conditions, the weather conditions, the uh, the detonation that is, that is prevalent in these cars. Uh, just the slightest bit of tire spin will overfuel the motor and they'll drop cylinders. It's a, this is a real guess game here. And, and I'll tell you what, to see... Alan Johnson pull a 467 with the track conditions the way they are to me is absolutely phenomenal. Well, no matter what happened to Shelly Anderson, I really believe she was defenseless against that. Oh, I have to agree with you. I don't think anybody in the first round could have uh, could have matched that at this particular point anyways. It will be interesting, though, to see what Corey Mack can do. Sid talked about his great qualifying effort Friday night. In fact, Bob Vandegrift Jr., who was low at the time, says, oh, this track's junk, and pulled his car out of line and pronounced the track his crew chief, Rick Castle, did uh, the dew point was in. You couldn't go down the racetrack. And what does Corey do? Goes out there and runs in the 60s. Let's again go back down to the far end of the racetrack with Bob Unkerford. Oh, sorry about that. Let's go to the starting line with Frank Holly. Good friend of mine over the years has been Ron Swearingen. You crew chief a lot of funny cars. Uh, tell me right now, after watching the dragsters, what you think the situation is going to be like for you guys. Uh, I think it's actually going to be pretty good. The racetrack looks excellent today, and I think these guys are just kind of overpowering it. Yeah. So you, you think that they think that the track was even better than it is? I think the air is throwing everybody off because it's been it's, it's changed a little bit um, from yesterday and the day before, and I think that's what's throwing them off because I think they're overcompensating for it. Now, you've got a tune-up today that you, you feel uh, pretty happy with with your car? Yeah, I think so. I'm going to go out here and try and run five flat or so. <laughs> well, that ought to do it. Uh, it, it. Do you think it's an advantage uh, having the funny cars run after the dragsters? Uh, yeah, it is. It, it, we don't have bald spots like we do when we run after the pro stocks, and that makes it a little bit better for us on the start line, a little less touchy. Ron Swearingen thinks he's going to run five flat. Steve? Well, I think you two have just set the world record for using the word think in one interview. That means <laughs> nobody knows what's going on. Oh, I tell you, Ron Swearingen used to work for me almost 25, 30 years ago. This kid, I used to have to run him out of my shop because he was 13 years old. He was still going to school, and he couldn't get enough of the sport. And here he is, one of the premier crew chiefs, and what a great job he has done. Well, still a little bit of track cleanup going on. The jet dryer is out there, and uh, I'm glad it's out there just for a little bit of oil instead of uh, the other substance that has been occasionally dripping upon us. And right now, we have got a guy in our booth. All right, is he ready? Is his microphone on? Our first guest of many this day will be Jim Head, driver of the Close Call Top Fuel Dragster. And your thoughts on the morning, Jim? Well, that 467 has definitely got everyone's attention, I'm sure, with uh, Alan and Gary. Mm -hmm. uh, you were in the show in the 16th spot, and at the last minute you got bumped out. I actually got in at the 15th spot. Uh, Kristen Powell put me to 16, and then Amato did his job, or uh, Jimmy Brock and, and Joey. Well, this, this was one tough field. I'll tell you, Steve, uh, 18 hundredths between number one and number 16 in top fuel. Uh, two more cars at 485. Uh, the last guy in the show was the second man in over 300 miles an hour. The, this is hardball. And I know you were the last guy to be surprised about what Gary Selzy and Alan Johnson just did. Absolutely. Uh, real close to those guys. Uh, they helped me a lot. Was in their career last night. No surprises. Well, I tell you what, I don't, no surprise by me, because I, I have watched Alan Johnson do this time after time again, and we will watch him do it for many, many years to come. What about lane choice, Jim? Had is that a factor? I haven't been out there this morning, Steve. I didn't feel it was yesterday. We were very happy with this racetrack. It's given, thrown me fits, obviously, but uh, the racetrack's in excellent shape. We were very pleased after Atlanta to come here and see the middle of the track hold the cars so well. You know, I heard a few pro stock drivers, uh, not complaining really, but commenting on a bump in the left-hand lane, kind of where you come off of the pad. Do you feel that in a dragster? Not, not my top fuel car, Steve. We're gone. <laughs> yeah, generally the top fuel cars are, are not as prone to the bumps as the, as the pro stocks are, and especially the pro, the pro stock bike. We heard Matt Hines make the comment that he actually double shifted when he hit the bump, and uh, that kind of a situation can happen to you. But top fuel cars and funny cars are not as prone to have a problem because they've got a lot of momentum going for them when they get to that point. 
Okay, let's quickly go down to Frank Hawley on the starting line. Well, I'm with one of the uh, federal mogul drivers, uh, one of the best alcohol funny car drivers ever, Bob Newberry. Bob, tell me what you think as far as the alcohol cars go as compared to what you see the fuel cars doing. Well, I was a little concerned about the track this morning because the weather's changed a lot. We've got a lot of cloud cover, it tried to rain, but from walking out there, the track looks pretty good. The first two cars down the track had a problem, but uh, that might have been their particular tune-up. I think this track looks as good as it's been Friday and Saturday, and I think everything will be okay. Does your alcohol funny car need as good a track, a better track, doesn't need as good a track, or just a different track than the fuel cars? Well, they don't make near as much power, but uh, they still require a pretty good track. We go out there, smoke the tires, and shake as hard as the fuel car, so the track's got to be pretty good. Okay, Steve? Well, Bob Newberry, not the only one checking out the racetrack. There's all kinds of drivers from all kinds of categories up there waiting to see what Eddie Hill does in the far lane and what Corey McClanathan can do in the near lane. Jim Head, driver of the close call stuff field racers, joined us in the booth. And uh, Corey Mack has taken the near lane or right-hand side of the racetrack. He had lane choice, Jim. Well, again, Steve, I think it's a two-lane racetrack. Uh, hopefully it'll stay that way all day. My feeling is really quite short down, but it's because that's where he ran the 465. So when you have that confidence behind you, you know you can run that good in that lane. Why do anything else? Mike Green, the crew chief for Corey McClanathan. Dan Olson for the big yellow Pennzoil car of Eddie Hill out of Wichita Falls, Texas. Eddie, a proud member of Racers for Christ. The university do a lot of public service work and uh, just find people that represent Pennzoil as they should be. Jim, you've had problems like Eddie's been struggling going through the last six months. What is it like as a racer, as a driver, as a car owner to have to go through this just terrible abuse? I'm afraid, Sid, I can't explain it or describe it. It's, it's miserable. There's no question about it. We've had our ups and downs. Uh, today's not one of our, our better days. But uh, Eddie will get it back. He's a, he's a great competitor. He's been around a long, long time. And trust me, he'll be back. Oh, I, there's not too much doubt in my mind about him. Boy, I'll tell you what. I mean, you talk about just Grin and Barrett. That's how Eddie's been over the last four or five races. And just squeaked into this field in the 15th position. How much horsepower do these cars make? Some people will tell you 6,000. What will you tell me, sir? Oh, anywhere between 5,500 and 6,500. It's in that range. Uh, I think, would you say so, Jim? I heard it. Now, uh, let's watch. Yeah. Whoa, does Corey Mac thunder by our position here at about 1,000 feet? Corey McLanathan with a 464. At 307 miles an hour, they came to party. Boy, they certainly did. You want to see something? Watch this in replay when we get it back because he dropped a cylinder about the 1,000-foot mark in the right-hand uh, right lane. You're telling me this car could have run quicker? Oh, it may not quicker, but it certainly would have run mile an hour faster. Jim Head, he pedaled it. Yes, he did. Looks like it was shaking a little bit, and Corey did an excellent job. Same thing he did Friday night. That is phenomenal to get a 464 at 307, Sid. There's the raw fuel pouring out of that right hand. It looked like number two cylinder. Didn't, didn't affect his ET, but it certainly had to hurt the mile an hour. There's no doubt about that. I got dropped it far enough down the racetrack. It really didn't uh, kill the ET or the mile an hour. Boy, I'll tell you what, to pedal it, then a wheel stand. That's about everything you can uh, experience in one of these cars all in four seconds, Jim. Yeah. Oh, doing a great job. I'd like say did the same thing Friday night to a 465 and just ran another 464. And that is... Kristen Powell, 18 years old, from Portland, Oregon. That is Bob Vandergrift, Jr. Johnny. 31 years old, from Cumming, Georgia. Unk is down at the far end. Bob, go ahead. 464, not bad, Corey. No, really, not the first round. This thing had the front end in the air and started smoke the tires. I had to pedal it again. I think this car likes to be pedaled for some reason. It sure runs on the other end when it does, but... I'll take that for a first round, and now it's Scott's turn. You guys in Celsius, you're looking pretty good out here. Yeah, well, we got to play catch-up. This McDonald's car's been running good lately, and we're just going to try one one round at a time. That'll do it. Well, I'll tell you what, that practice run that he had, I mean, that lifting and pedaling there on Friday night certainly paid off on that first round. You know, this is a brand-new car for Bob Vandergrift. They tried to test it Monday after Atlanta. We were out there. They had nothing but bad luck, blue motors up. And I said, Bob, you had, if your car wasn't old, you replaced. He said, these cars don't last as long as they used to. You've got to replace them. Appears like we might have a little bit of a problem with them getting the car out of reverse and into forward gear. Uh, they were rocking the car back and forth. Of course, we can't see at this particular point. There Chris, it goes. Yep, he's ready. Kristen Powell, the Royal Purple car for Jersey's activewear is Bob Vandegrift, Jr.
Kristen Powell has enjoyed a single round victory this season. That came at Pomona against Larry Dixon round one. Kristen Powell did a magnificent job of pedaling that car for a rookie driver, but it was not quite enough. Bob Vandegrift Jr. at 488, 272 miles an hour, but Kristen leapt on him and did a really nice job. Well, I'll tell you what, Bob Vandegrift had to pedal as well, so it was a good driving job by both of these drivers. All right, we're going to see the Jim Head. Why don't you talk about this? Okay, they both left, looks like, together. Here we come with the pedal job. Christian did a fantastic job, no question about that. And yeah, so did Bob, obviously. Looks like he hurt the engine, but they'll be back next round. Believe me, they're happy to get a win like that. It looks like Christian hurt the right-hand side of the motors. It didn't, yeah, all those flames went away. Yeah, it certainly did. Apparently about the uh, eight, 900 foot mark, it did some engine damage, probably during the back pedal situation. That will hurt the motors drastically. Our next pair will be Mike Dunn for Daryl Gwynn, Team Mopar, up against Larry Dixon, the Miller Light Car, owned by Don the Snake Prudhomme. And Bob Unkefer is with Bob Vandegrift, Jr. Tell him, for all of us, great driving job. Well, on behalf of Steve Evans and everybody up in the booth, they said great driving job, and that's exactly what it was. 488, you got to the stripe first. Well, that's a good run for our team. I mean, it shook the tire and started to spin, and I had to pedal it, and... Uh, we're just glad we can put the jerseys cars in round two. It's tough out there right now, and hopefully we'll get a handle on it for the next round. Um, I'd like to say hey to Bernie Stewart. He's the father of one of my crew guys who's in the hospital back in California. Tell him to get well and get back out here. We need you. But they're doing pretty good right now. Yes, we are. Thank you. I tell you, that car will win a drag race this season if Bob Vandegrift Jr. himself can stay focused and stay calm in the car as he just did. Yes, he certainly did. He did a magnificent job. But I'll tell you, once again, it's coming back to seat time. Is that right, Jim? The more time you have going down this racetrack, the more with good ETs and good reaction time, the better off you're going to be as a driver. Absolutely. Sid, it's a, it's a comfort level. There's no question about it. And, and Bob, every time he goes down the racetrack, every time he has to do that, it's going to be more comfortable in that car. And there's no question they're going to be a force to be reckoned with. Uh, Rick Castle, Bob Benedict, tough, tough group. I'll tell you, Rick, since he's come on board, has just done a phenomenal team with that Bob Vandegrift and the Jersey's team. Frank Hawley, what does the racetrack look like? Is it getting better? It certainly appears to be. Well, I'll tell you, the traction's been absolutely fabulous, as you can see. But we just started to get a few drops of rain. I'm with the NHRA's uh, number one starter, Rick Stewart. Uh, Rick, uh, right now it's obviously raining quite hard, but uh, a couple minutes ago uh, you looked out at Jerry Gwynn. You put your hands out. Uh, were you asking his opinion? No, I just let him know I could feel the rain coming down. It's the reason I'm out here on a cool day without a jacket on, so I can I can feel the drops when they do come down. You can look down here in, in the last tire track that just went down a track, and you can see the sprinkles. We have to wait until it's completely dry. It's safety first. So uh, we've got all the equipment. The safety safari will take good care of things. We'll get this thing dried out as fast as we can. As soon as it quits, then we'll put the dryer on it, put the jet on it, and uh, as soon as it's done, then we'll get, get going back to racing again. Obviously, if you just had a couple drops, it, it wouldn't require the jet dryer, but as you said, it looks like uh, we're probably going to see the jets out on the track again. Yeah, it's sprinkling right now pretty good, so uh, we're probably going to be on hold for at least five or ten minutes. Uh, went over to uh, Forces Technology trailer and looked at his weather station uh, earlier today. It looks like we got about a three or four hour break, and uh, so hopefully uh, this is going to be the last of what we got right now, and uh, then we'll... Uh, Get, you know, get at least two or three laps in. Hopefully we can get the whole event done today. Well, that's what we're trying to do. Obviously, you've got a number of tasks up here on the starting line. You actually flip the switch to send the cars down the racetrack. You've got a whole team out here. You've got to feel a lot of responsibility to look at that racetrack and determine when it's okay for them to go down. Is, is that your call? Well, it's a total team effort, you know. You've got me up here on the starting line. we got A.J. down at the 3.30, and, and then uh, we got Jim Van Dyke down at the finish line, Lefty Grice and Randy Robbins work uh, down at the uh, shutoff area. And it's everybody's call here, and it can be raining down in the shutoff area and be dry on the starting line or the, uh, vice versa. So we all stay in communication with our radios and, and uh, make sure it's safety first, and then let's go racing, you know. The last thing I get to do is flip the switch. There's sure a lot of things that we got to look at before we do that. 
that, Frank. You know, I was talking with Steve Gibbs earlier about track drying and preparation, and one of the things he said is not only is it a safety issue, but when we send those cars down the racetrack, we want to see some good performances, and we know we need a dry track to do that. Absolutely, and uh, I know Mr. Gibbs has, over years has developed this situation and uh, where we give them the best possible racetrack we can, and when you see these 460 and these 450 elapsed times, uh, a lot of it has to do with the cars themselves, but the track's got to be there also, and the safety safari is totally responsible for that. These guys are going to do the best job they can if Mother Nature helps out too. Steve? Well, we thought maybe we had dodged this weather bullet, but uh, maybe this is only a flesh wound. Down at the far end is Kristen Powell with the Ankh, and I got to tell you, she may be only 18, Ankh, but she drove uh, like a veteran, a yeoman's performance. Yeoman's performance, very true, Steve. Kristen, uh, got a little warm in the cockpit on that fast. Yeah, well, you know, we weren't planning on something like that happening. It's kind of a bummer, but, you know, th these things happen. We're just going to come out here, and we're going to test, and we're going to come back, and we're going to try to win. And this car is going to keep on thundering. You're a win waiting for a place to happen, I can tell you. Yes, but every single pass I get down the track is experience, so I learned something from that pass, too. It does get warm. Yes, it does. That was the learning experience that time. What did you mean, Jim, about getting a little warm in there? I'm not sure I knew what that meant. Well, Steve, you can definitely feel that heat coming off those fires in the top fuel car, even though that engine's behind you. We've uh, definitely experienced that a couple times. Okay, we're starting to get some of our um, notes from you people off of the Internet and the NHRA homepage, and uh, hopefully we'll be getting to those a little soon. We've got to go through them first and see exactly what we have got here. Okay. Well, I tell you what we have right now is one of the greatest drivers, one of the greatest car owners now in the history of this sport, Mr. Don the Snake Perdon with Frank Holley. Don, uh, you guys have had kind of a rough season to say the least, right? <laughs> yeah, you might say that. Uh, you know, we were struggling a little bit last year and uh, we thought we made the right changes uh, during the winter months. and. You know, things that just haven't worked out quite yet. But, uh, you know, it's starting to come around. You know, the qual car qualified real well. You know, ran a, a 67, so that's nothing to be uh, you know, not too shabby. It's just a matter of getting the Miller car uh, running consistent. And that's uh, harder to do than some people might think. You go out and run 460, you come back and drop a hole and run 480 or something. Uh, it, it's not that hard to have some pretty bright people kind of get lost running these cars, right? Yeah, Frank, as, uh, as you well know, you know, you've been in this sport a long time. It can sure humble you because there's so many variables involved that uh, folks just don't realize, you know, with the, with the clutch disc and different parts and pieces. And to get them to run consistent and keep that 5,000 horsepower hooked up to the ground, it's, uh, it's pretty difficult to make everything work right. And uh, if it doesn't quit raining here pretty soon, it's going to be impossible to get hooked up. Yeah, it sure is. You know, uh, the, the track was really ideal just a little while ago. You know, Corey laid down that great 64 run, and, you know, it's, uh, it's fabulous right now. It's just a matter of uh, this weather moved in on us. We'll wait and see what happens. All right, thank you. Okay, Frank Holly, a busy boy, but thank you very much for helping us fill these idle hours. You see uh, Kim Richards, the former Kim LaHaye, just kind of hanging out. Tom Anderson there, crew chief for the Snake's funny car. Jim had a two-car team like Don Perdomo's trying to do that. So that's a lot to bite off. Yeah, it's one too many fuel cars as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> Especially a top fuel car and a fuel funny car. Maybe two top fuel cars, possibly. Yeah. It's a, it's a tough deal. Or like Forrest is doing with two funny cars. Where exactly. Apples and apples, in other words. Right. When you can go out there and learn some things. Why is a top fuel drag just so much different than a funny car? It's the same basic engine. Definitely the same engine. We, we run all the same components, but the clutch setup is considerably different, making the engine setup different, and they're very difficult to tune one from another. Okay, again, let's go back and look at some of the historic Pro Stock qualifying from Friday night. This was what it looked like when the weather was still good. The track was still dry, and the air was about as perfect as it can get. Jen Coughlin and George Marnell was this pair. Troy Coughlin, his father's name is Jack. His father... To my knowledge, is the only man that ever drove and won events, I believe in all three, Top Fuel, Funny Car, and Pro Stock. He competed in all three. I'm not sure he won a Pro Stock National event. But Jed Coughlin, I hope you're watching from Columbus, Ohio, the mail order masters in the high performance world. And that is a motor, or Friday night was a motor from Warren Johnson inside that Pro Stock automobile. So Warren, in some ways, has a three-car team. 
this engine leased to Troy Coplin. And Coplin, his driving reaction times have just been superb for the latter half of 96 and early 97. It, you've got to have a few hundreds in reserve if you want to beat Troy Coplin because he's probably going to nip you at the starting line. Yeah, Troy's an exceptionally good lever. And, of course, you know his father was an ex fuel racer, and the whole family is very, very involved. I believe there's three Coplins out here racing this weekend. And I tell you, George Marnell, the GTS car, major masonry contractor in Las Vegas, Nevada. This is his relaxation. This is his golf course. This is what he likes to do strictly for the fun of it. And on Friday night, George Marnell was having a lot of fun and running very, very hard. Those were side by side, six second qualifying runs, a 696 for Troy Coughlin and a 693 for George Marnell. If you've just joined us, unfortunately, no, this is not live first round coverage of Pro Stock. We are in a hold situation due to a shower on the racetrack. This is a recap of Friday night's Pro Stock qualifying session. Between the four sessions, this track yielded the quickest 16 car field in the history of NHRA Winston Championship drag racing and with Warren Johnson, the first 300, 200 mile an hour run. So this was Scott, Je this was Gerald Alderman, I'm sorry. Or is this Jeffrey? Who is this? This is Alderman. Alderman at this point was not qualified. Even though he had run a 699, he was not in the show. In fact, nine six second performers were out of here, as Bob Price says. Did you ever drive a pro stock car, Jim Hit? No, I haven't. But we used to have comp cars that were somewhat similar back in the early 70s, but nothing this quick and fast. These things are a rush, that first 60 feet, right out of second. The Dodge fans had their fingers crossed and they were rewarded. The Mopar Dodge Avenger of Darrell Alderman got right in the show with another great six second run. And this was the moment a lot of people came for. The buzz was not only around the pits, it was also among the fans. You could just feel it in the hair in your arms, if you have any hair in your arms. The air was just right, Sid Waterman. We were all saying, tonight's the night. Yes, we certainly were. And I, I, I mean, nobody was surprised when this actually happened. To see Warren Johnson finally, after all this time, he has done 200 miles an hour in testing on several different occasions, but that doesn't count. You've got to have both the run and the backup, which on, on two clocks. And the scary part for Warren was he knew how good it was. You had to hope somebody in the lanes in front of you didn't do it before you did, because it's just first, period. And NHRA now determines the running order in qualifying. It's not just who, who shows up into the lanes first. And there were actually two cars that were very close to running that fast before him, including Jim Yates, but didn't quite pull it off. He was up against Steve Schmidt in this side-by-side -side qualifying. Schmidt wished this was round one because with his hole shot, he actually got to the strike first. Suddenly a lot of eyes switched over to Steve Schmidt. He's a big number car as well. But they flashed back to the scoreboard in the far lane as Warren Johnson put it up there for him. And the place went wild. 200.13 miles an hour and normally aspirated 500 inch car. Gordy Greg Anderson. Kurt Johnson, all of them, big payday, $25,000, coupled with, go ahead, Sid Water. Yeah, not only $25,000 there, he also has got set the national record, and if nobody gets quicker than him, it'll be another $50,000 on top of that. That's right, the $50,000 could come from the MBNA program. If Warren leaves here, this was Warren getting out of the car. He didn't know what he'd run yet. Oh, boy. Anyway, I was going to say the... Bonus money from MBNA plus that Rockingham money. In about three weeks, Warren Johnson could make very close to $100,000 of the pro stock car. He certainly can. All right, let's go again go back down to Frank Hawley with a fuel funny car crew chief. Where, what are they thinking, Frank? I'm with John Medlin and uh, one of the many crew chiefs, it seems like, on the force team. Tell me a little bit about what you saw in the first round of funny, or in the first round of top fuel and how you think that's going to affect the funny cars. 
Well, we saw some varied condition. It's hard to judge whether the, the guys are a little overzealous or not. There was some tire smoking and pedaling going on. The racetrack, from all visual indication, looks perfect. If this weather clears up, um, it should clean the track up pretty good. I think it'll be real good. Obviously, having the funny cars run after the dragsters has got to help you guys a little bit. Uh, wh where do you feel like you want to be in pairing as far as you, you want to get right up there after the dragsters? Our favorite spot is the third pair. Um, I think you could key off what the dragsters are doing because the mile an hour is good. One of our concerns is always what's going on in the top end of this track. And from all indications, there's been some big speeds. So we think the top end of the track is going to be good. I think if you was anywhere in the first five pair, you'd be just fine. So to get things dried off out here, you're going to go back to your car. You're not going to make any adjustments. You made a decision here an hour or a couple hours ago how you're going to run the car, and that's just how we're going to see it in the first round, right? Yeah, providing the weather doesn't change any as far as temperature and, and barometric pressure, we'll leave it the same. If there's a weather pattern change with pressure and possibly temperature, we may make some change. But uh, as far as the aggressiveness of the clutch, we'll leave that alone. Now, you guys got some pretty advanced stuff back there to see what's going on with the weather. Do you have somebody that's actually reading it now that can come out and give you some updated information? We actually have telemetry in the explorers that tell us what's going on with the weather station. And this weather pattern indicates that, that there's some moisture out there and a little window. If the pattern moves to the north and a little bit east, we'll be in the window and we'll be able to run it. If it stays in the middle of the, of the pattern, it'll rain for a little while. So you actually got in your tow vehicles like the weather channel. You can drive around and see what it's, what it's doing, right? Right. We, we have a program in the Explorers that allow us to look at the weather station at all times. It's pretty handy when you're removed from the trailer. It sounds like it. Maybe that's going to help you guys in the first round. Steve? Okay, well, as you can tell by the garb in the grandstands, the weather is not ideal here in the Old Dominion country of Virginia. And, you know, we're starting to get now some of our uh, Internet stuff, and some actually came in earlier in the week, and we went out and answered them uh, in the pits for you. And this is pretty interesting, and it comes from Richard Holcomb of Versailles, Indiana. And Richard Holcomb asks, why don't the fuel classes do dry hops anymore? Remember, they do the long burnout and then do a hop? We asked Dale Armstrong. Well, the reason we don't do dry hops anymore is because it puts too much heat in the clutch. In the old days, we could do a dry hop when we had transmissions because the clutch wasn't so hot. But nowadays, with a high gear setups only, the clutch just barely makes the finish line anyway without it already being overheated. Okay, and some of these we can answer from here in the booth. And I know how frustrating this particular person is, having been a track operator in the past and run a number of different racing facilities. And the subject of the question is, I'm trying to see exactly who it's from. That's kind of difficult. From R. Mesbergen. And I won't read you the whole thing because it's kind of long, but he wants to know what, uh, first of all, he likes our pay-per-view broadcast. And he saw a letter in National Drag Store, I saw it as well, complaining about fans standing up. And this was from Gainesville, I believe. That can't everybody sit down, then everybody can see. Well, you know, <laughs> easier said than done. I mean, I've said it against, you guys have said it against it a thousand feet. We go, oh, man, look at that, and you stand up, and you force everybody else to stand up. And the reason the NHRA don't take answer that directly in National Drag is because there really isn't a very good answer. If everybody, you just can't control people when they get excited. They I've, want to I've sat in the grandstands a dozen times down the far end, and if you sit there and sit down, everybody else can stand up. You can't see a thing except a wall of people, so you've got to stand up with them. And it's a very unfortunate situation. There's nothing. What do we do? Put seat belts on and tie them down? <laughs> that isn't a bad idea. I like that one. Simpson will like that, too. <laughs> but it also depends on the racetrack design. And tracks like this one in Virginia, the newer tracks, Dallas and Houston, when they erect the grandstands, they angle them just slightly. Okay, here's the racetrack going right at you. Angle them this way, because if they're straight, this guy stands up, this guy stands up. If they're like this and fanned out just a little bit, it works far better. Only takes a few degrees to make that happen, and hopefully racetrack operators will think of that in the future when designing drag strips. Well, you know, it's very important the fans get to see that. You know, let's go back to that dry hop question a while ago. Jim, yeah. obviously you have a fuel car. Do uh, you agree with Dale Armstrong and everything he said where that's concerned? Well, absolutely. We, we actually quit doing dry hops uh, before we went to high gear only for the same reason. We were hard on the clutch. But i got to tell you, I miss them. They were fun. In a funny car, if you're a funny car doing dry hops, ooh, that, that was big. Uh, great for the fans, too. But you know, with the high gear setups we've got and the way we run these cars, uh, we can't possibly stand any more heat in the clutch than we've already got. But the dry hops weren't really done for any kind of showmanship. It was really kind of a test of the surface, was it not? Absolutely. We would actually make a dry hop, come back and make a, a, a minor adjustment on occasion. 
Yeah, I mean, well, every now and then they'd make a dry hop, and on the dry hop and spin the tires. They'd back up and make another dry hop, and they'd get the hot clutch hot enough that it would slip, and then they knew they could get it down the race course. Of course, then sometimes that created engine problems, because in those days we certainly didn't have the fuel systems we got today to, to cover up the heat. Okay, as we continue to try to amuse all of you on our pay-per-view broadcast with our downtime, let's again go back to the historic qualifying session in Pro Stock on Friday night. The quickest build in history. Don't want to be redundant, but I think that's worth saying again. And this was Mike Edwards and Bruce Allen. Edwards over on the far side. Bruce Allen was at the near lane. Now at Atlanta, was it Atlanta? Yeah, Mike Edwards made his pro stock car into a giant bird. It flew way up in the air and did not make a three-point landing. So that car may or may not ever be repaired. They had another new car that they had not liked at all. Mike was not comfortable in it. They couldn't seem to make it work. So they went back to the last year's car, the 96 Pontiac, that uh, got him uh, one of the Winston Finals, a couple of wins, as a matter of fact, and co-rookie of the year honors with Matt Hines. And what can you say about the slick 50 car of Bruce Allen? Boy, I'll tell you, this, they're resurgent. Rare and Morrison are back. They certainly are. I'll tell you, down in Houston, they just put on one heck of a show, going all the way to the final round. And I really thought that Bruce might be able to pull it off, but unfortunately for him, Jim Yates' horsepower was just a little bit too much for, uh, uh, for Bruce Allen to overcome. Mike Edwards, a soft-spoken guy, not only the driver, but also the crew chief on that car over in the far side, the John Kite owned entry. Bruce Allen got out of the groove, the car got sideways, he shut it down. Mike Edwards did need to shut it down. Mike Edwards hammered the car into the program with a 6.98 second elapsed time. Jim, tell us how, how important is it to stay in that groove. Let's talk about this groove for a second. This is really quite important, especially for a, a car like the Pro Stocks that have four, four gears to shift or five. Well, and, and the top few cars are the same thing, Sid. Uh, the groove is very, very critical, depending on the racetrack. Some racetracks have a little wider groove than others. We just came from Atlanta, the narrowest groove I've raced on that I can remember. I never did stay in the groove at Atlanta. Uh, it cost me... Sure. The 470s, we were running 480s when we should have been running 470s simply because we couldn't keep the car in the groover. I say we, I couldn't keep the car straight. They're pretty tough. And the pro stocks are in the same situation. There's no question about it. They spin the tire when they get out of the groove. Well, you know, and it's awful hard when you got your front wheels in the air and a top fuel car, and it does carry over the first couple hundred feet to steer the thing because it's just not going to go anywhere with the wheels in the air. Well, regretfully, if you if you oversteer with the wheels in the air and you do come down, you're, you're going to really get in trouble. Now, these guys have to be really alert that first 100 feet. Kurt Johnson, this was Friday night, up alongside Larry Nance, former NBA All-Star, one of the nicest guys, one of the tallest guys I have ever met. And his head has got to be somewhere just below the back window line. He's seven feet tall. Big boy. Nance had problems, got out of it. Kurt Johnson had no problem whatsoever matching, or almost matching, his father's performance of 6.89 seconds. Didn't quite get the second 200 mile an hour run, missed by just, well, 199.20, not much. And next up after this pair was Pete Williams and Terry Adams. They'll be, there they are right there. And again, if you just joined us, we are in a holding pattern as they continue to await for some decent weather and a dry racetrack. Let me make a point on that uh, run by Kurt Johnson. Now, we know Warren has already set the national record, but the 489 with an 8 that Kurt has set is also under the national record. If he backs it up quicker than Warren, he could walk away with that $50,000 instead of his dad. You think Warren's going to let that? Well, it doesn't matter. It goes to the same bank account. They go, well, yeah, maybe. I, I bet it matters to, uh, to Warren and uh, to the kid both. Yeah. Okay, here's another pair from Friday night, and this again would be side-by-side, side, six second pro stock qualifying. Terry Adams and Pete Williams. Pete Williams, another one of these guys that does this for giggles, for grins, you know? I mean, he wants to win a national. I mean, he's come close to it. He's made a final round, but he just has an awful lot of fun. He was a former pro mod racer, the class that has run on a limited base at an NHRA racetrack as a special event and run by HRA as a... Uh, legitimate category, man. I tell you, it's a lot of fun to watch, but Pete just wanted to get deadly serious about his racing, and it doesn't get any more serious than NHRA Pro Stock.
ever in one session has so many six-second post-act times been clocked, and these were side-by-side, side, both of them at 696. You know, Just, you, made a, you made a point a second ago. Something I did? About ha yeah, about, ha about I love having it when I make a point. fun. Jim, how much fun is it compared to what it used to be in the sport, especially in the professional ranks? Well, regretfully, it's turned into quite a business. I, I, I was one of those guys that just wanted to have fun, and uh, we have a little too much fun now. But I, I'm not, not second-guessing myself. I enjoy what I'm doing. It, it is a big business, no question about it. And it's, a tremendous amount of work, just a phenomenal amount of work. by the, How many guys you got on your crew, six? I've got eight people that work for me full-time, and uh, I don't know that any of the top teams have very many fewer. Uh, several have more. Not counting text the dog. But still, the fun of this business, for me, and I don't know if I can't speak for anybody else, is the camaraderie and all the friends you have and the one-liners and the practical jokes and uh, just being around a great group of people. That's the fun still. That's what this sport's all about and always has been all about. It's a very close-knit family all the way from the comp cars and the, and the super stalkers right on up to the top few guys. And it's kind of interesting. I was walking through the pits the other, uh, at the Houston race, and one of the comp guys came by, and he says, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, the professional guys are basically filling for us. And that's kind of an interesting comment when most people think it's the other way around. i got to tell you, Sid, I raced comp cars for <laughs> yeah, uh, 17 years, and throughout that whole period, I didn't even know they ran top fuel. <laughs> there you go. It's a perfect example. You know, there's been uh, a bit of uh, controversy lately, some deserve, some not, over mufflers on race cars, and they're not unique in a lot of other forms of motorsports that I cover. I see them on Trans Am cars, I see them on Sprint cars, but drag racing has never really had to kind of deal with the whole muffler thing. And Ryan Koner, doesn't say where he's from, asked, why are the super class cars the only ones that are going to be required to have mufflers? Don't the other classes make noise too? We asked Carl Olson. The uh, super category cars are probably the most easy to implement muffler rules on from the standpoint of equalizing of competition and ease of installation and all of that. I think the real issue is that most cars in MHRA drag racing at some time are likely to have mufflers on them, like it or not. At least that's the determination of the NHRA field department. In order to keep tracks healthy, uh, noise attenuation has to be accomplished. And it just turns out that in the opinion of the NHRA technical people, the super category cat uh, competition is the easiest to implement for trial purposes until we get the whole muffler program sorted out. Well, let's remember this year at the Winter Nationals, Kevin McClelland won Supergas through the mufflers. Yes, and I'll tell you what, he works for a, a company that designs and makes mufflers, and uh, to, for him to do that was absolutely phenomenal. I'll tell you what, his proud papa was really a happy man. And, you know, I talked to Jack Roush and some other engine builders, but Roush particularly, and he said with their Trans Am cars, he can make a little more horsepower than mufflers than without them. Manage probably a little bit of back pressure, more torque than horsepower or a little dig out of that corner with mufflers on the car that without them. And we're not talking about mufflers like on a Cadillac or Lincoln Town car. They're still going to sound like race cars. It just takes the edge off them a little bit. Well, you know, uh, Superflow is probably the leader in the technology of making the, uh, the exhaust mufflers the way that they are, and they really have all they are is a, is a one tube going through another tube, and it just deadens the sound. It really doesn't hurt the performance of them that much, and Superflow has really done a great job in tuning the headers in such a way that the cars get the performance back even though they go through the mufflers. Jim had little chance we're going to put mufflers on top fuel or funny cars. But Jim, I was talking to Mark Oswald at Atlanta, and he said their headers are really only lasting a race or maybe six rounds because the downforce is so tremendous that they're coming apart. No question about it. It's a, it's a real problem. Top fuel cars, he, uh, funny car headers are worse. They weigh more. They're heavier. They're longer. But we don't uh, get nearly as many races as we used to. A lot more heat, a lot more power, a lot more thrust coming out of those headers than ever before. And one, one point that you need to make, though, is the fact the only reason they last as long as they are is they have two tubes. There's an inner tube and an outer tube. Right. And the reason that basically is done is if oil gets through the valve cover gasket you know, or something, it doesn't get on the header and ignite into a ball of fire. The outside tube keeps the inside tube from uh, effect, getting affected by the oil getting on that bright red header. You know, quickly, another uh, note from the Internet. This is unsigned from somewhere in the Midwest, is I've always loved Linda Vaughn, Miss Hearst Golden Shifter. Is she still actively involved in drag racing? I see her at Winston Cup races and IndyCar races. Does she still go to the drag races? Bob, Bob Unkerford, does Linda Vaughn still go to the drag races? Uh, Steve, yes, I think uh, Linda Vaughn does still go to the drag races. She's down here with me on the starting line, starting line right now, and I tell you what, 
Stephen uh, Sid have been talking about the wonderful pro stock performance this weekend, and it has been phenomenal. I know it's your favorite category. Oh, oh it's one of my favorite. I tell you, everybody in a six-second run. I mean, well, how do you go home and say I, I ran a 684 and I didn't qualify? We had a lot of good cars that didn't qualify. Yeah, it was a tough field. First ever all six-second field and six cars that didn't make it that ran six. That ran six is the most sixes there is out there. I'm telling you, we've had so much fun though, and I just hate that we had the weather right now. It's been a really good pro stock show. Well, it'll continue to be a pretty good pro stock show as the weekend and the day progresses, I guess I should say. But in answer to the internet question, yes, Liz, Miss Hurst, Linda Vaughn is still active with us on the drag racing and right here with me. And they're still shifting my gears after all these years. <laughs> I can't top that. <laughs> let, 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 me, let me tell you about not being able to top something. Yesterday, here at Virginia Motorsports Park, the brilliant Bob Fry was on the public address system with Linda Vaughn doing pro stock. And Bob said, what a great racetrack, Linda. Look at this great crowd. And Linda said, you know, Bob, Virginia is for lovers. What are you doing tonight? Fry seized. I've about never seen him speechless in my life. Said, well, well, I've been married to the same woman for, for 30 years. <laughs> and I think Linda maybe had her hand on his knee. Just give it a little squeeze. I'm telling you about Fry. He was finished. He lost it. I've never seen Bob Fry at a loss for words in all the years I've known him. Oh, it was wonderful. You want to see a little more pro stock qualifying from Friday night? I don't care if you do or not. It's all we got. <laughs> so here it comes. Uh, we'll chit-chat a little bit around it. Now, not often do you see side-by-side -side Dodges, but this was it. Allen and Johnson, the independent Dodge with the Steve Schmidt built Dodge motor that qualified back went to the semis at the Winston Invitational at Rockingham. He was alongside yet another Dodge of Scott Jeffrey on. Dale Ike, that's the gentleman on the right-hand Scott side waving that door and out trying to get some of the smoke out of it. What an intense guy he is. Oh, boy, what a... You know something, here's a guy that's taking a team that was really struggling bad time and brought them right back with a great job that he did. Yes, they dare all know the fantastic 493, put him right in the program. The Dodge hopes for alive again. These cars have been struggling, but Scott, he's one of the best drivers that ever drove a pro stock car. Like I said, they got two of them with Warren Johnson. Let me tell you, this guy, Alan Johnson, isn't bad either. He showed pole shot in his way into the semifinals at Rockingham. In fact, he left on Champion right there, too. Just to say he could. But it was Jeffrey on from behind for the 698 to Alan Johnson's trailing 707, as you see what it takes to shut down a pro stock car. Well, all in all, it's been a pretty good weekend for the Dodges with Jeffrey on and Alderman. I believe they're both in the program. I don't believe that Jeffrey on. Oh, that's right. His, six, his 698 was not good enough, if you can believe that. You know what they're doing? They're rotating a particularly good motor back and forth between Jeffrey on and Alderman so that the drivers get, you know, equal performance from one race to another. They just don't yet have enough time to have equal motors for both cars. Well, you know, that takes a, a lot of effort to, to make two of these unblown naturally aspirated engines, especially running on stock pump gasoline. I mean, it, it's just... Uh, the, the fact that they can make a car run 200 miles an hour. I remember when I had, when, when, it took me five years to get my top fuel car to run 200 miles an hour. Absolutely. Wasn't that many years ago, Sid? No, and, it wasn't. And you know, Jim, had the racetrack is your dyno. That's the only dyno we've got with fuel. Is to come out and put it down the racetrack and see what it'll do. These guys, all of their money, all of their time really is spent at the shop. They don't make a little, they don't make a lot of change to these engines once they get here. Other little carburetor jetting and adjusting the valves. That's about it. Again, this was Friday night. The sun was going down Friday evening, and these fans have started to really understand around this. It takes, this is only the third year, let's remember. There, it, this is interesting. That Purvis car you see over there, Robert Presley, that is the last of the Bob Glidden Ford probes. They bought a lot of Glidden parts, almost everything he had, and Rusty Glidden was out here on Friday night to give him a hand, and I said, hey, Rusty, you're going to build motors for me? He said, nope, they bought our stuff. This is our deal. I'll come out here, help him get the car down the racetrack and see what we can do. 
This was Danny Kaufman and Robert Patrick. And I can tell you that later on, I believe they qualified that car. Did they not, Sid? No, they, uh, did, they did not. But got a six-second run out of that Ford Probe before they left. Even as a non-qualifier, they made a lot look, of progress. Look at that swoopy body. Look how rounded everything is. I mean, you talk about non... Uh, there's no absolutely no air resistance whatsoever to that car. It, it just glides through the air. These post-stock cars are absolutely beautiful today. Well, I tell you, that Ford Probe was one of the slickest post-stock cars ever built. Glidden did not want to abandon it for him. He tried a Mustang, and he said it was so bad in the wind tunnel, it scared him to death. He didn't want to drive it. Yeah, the Probe was uh, really a lot of European influences in the body design of that car. So here you will see Robert Patrick on a good run. It wasn't his best of the weekend, but he did get the car in the sixes. Carmen and Michael Bell will be the next pair up. The car you want to watch here, Mike Bell actually qualifies this car, a tremendous effort, but uh, you might kind of watch over on the far side of the racetrack, because that's pretty much where the action is. Yeah, Dexter, Dexter Cameron pretty much had his hands full. Keep an eye on that lane over there, and you'll understand what we're talking about, folks. And what they're doing there, in case you don't understand, these cars gather enough smoke right through the tin work that it fills the engine or the uh, the uh, bodies up with smoke, and they want as clear a vision as they possibly can. So they open the doors when they're backing up. That allows the air to go in, circulate, and let the smoke come back out. And then when they get back behind the starting line, they actually open both doors and open and close them, just fanning the uh, the smoke out of there. That's called turning on the AC. Turning on the AC. Old pros, doctor. That was Desta Cameron rubbing the shiny off it. He blew a motor, put a lot of oil under the rear tires, sure. and did a spectacular job of driving that race car. Had he got on the brakes, he was finished. He'd have spun Lord knows how many times and probably hit both walls. As it was, he just kept with it, got the parachute out, stayed away from that brake pedal, and the damage was minimal. We say goodbye to Jim Head. Steve? We'll see you in Dallas next weekend. Sid? The we'll club's call, Top Fuel Dragster. Hopefully, better fortunes. Okay, thanks, guys. Okay, man. We'll see you. Say hi to Tex the dog. I'll do it. Love that dog. <laughs> He's a great dog. <laughs> okay, I think we got Joe Amato waiting in the wings, who's going to be in here in just a moment. But first, here's how people are getting to us for our interactive portion of this broadcast. There's the address at the bottom of the screen. Just emails. It's really simple. It's interactive. It's simple. We've got people... Operators are standing by. Actually, are, are sitting by. And here's one that we got from Dana Amon of Gibsonia, Pennsylvania. And Damon asked several questions here, but one of them was, since Jim Epler sold his operation to Kristen Powell and those people, <coughs> what will Jim Epler do now? Is he out of a job or what? Hey, Jim, whenever you're ready. Okay, my duties now as uh, team manager for Team Scandia really doesn't change much not being the owner the only the biggest difference really is now that we have the resources of team scan to we're going to make this operation into a world class world championship type of team and uh, with Andy Evans he's a racer he understands racing and we're going to take this year and do a little testing and really come out strong next year so as far as uh, my duties uh, really hasn't changed much but now I don't have to pay the bills I guess well we have another uh it's mixed emotions, the guys coming to the booth or girls to join us, because it generally means you didn't qualify or you already got beat. In Joe Amato's case, Joe Amato, you lost, but in spectacular fashion. We're going to roll that tape, and you can tell us what you see and what your sensations were. This will be from the burnout, Joe. It looks out. Yeah, the car definitely had a lot of power. Usually you can get a feel for the track and do the burnout, how it, the, the fish tails a little or if it hooks up. So you have a sense of the track, but... The, you know, the air conditions changed a lot today and the weather changed, so we backed the car down a little bit, but when, you know, Bernstein went out and smoked the tires right away in the first round, and, you know, we're the fourth pair, it makes you real nervous being the driver, and Joe Amato was definitely plenty nervous, but, 
you know, you were trying to do your job. The, the team were running over there. They ran a couple pretty consistent runs, 78 and 79. So you can't back the car down too much and beat yourself. I watched Tommy Johnson right before us pedal the car and lose because the car alongside him made a decent run. So, you know, all this is running through your head. And you're sitting in there thinking, well, you know, what's the right thing to do? Pedal it early, pedal it late, don't pedal it, you know, grab the brake. But, the, you know, I just had to rely on trying to get off the line and let my, my instinct take over. And, uh, this thing it did, but I think my reflexes were too fast in this case. We went back and looked at the tape. When the when the car left the starting line, it went out pretty good. And it really had the wheels up. Let's right watch it, Jeff. Or Joe as it comes along. Now, there's Jimmy Pratt. Got those tires as clean as I can get them. And you're thinking right now. Or you're trying not to think. No, I'm not thinking. I'm on autopilot at this point. You can see the wheels up strong. And, and it broke the, broke the tires. And I got back on the trial twice. And then it actually blew a rod out of it. Was there ever a moment in that run, especially when you got it sideways, that you thought, oh boy, I've gotten myself in trouble here? Yeah, when the car went sideways a little bit, I thought I had a chance hitting the wall. It kind of, I just wanted to, didn't want to ruin the car. That's important sure. when you're driving the car. But the, on the replay, we have a camera on the, on the we did a sideline camera, and then it can match that to the computer. And I blew up the throttle right as it started to smoke the tires, but I was off on the throttle too quick. And, and it, it never dried up, or in this case, you're probably, you know, your reflexes, you're just so pumped up in there, you just re, re, react and uh, you just go fast. Sure. Well, you know, one of the things is, you've got those two great big tires that are spinning. There's like two huge fly, uh, flywheels on each side of the car. Once that momentum is going, when you back out of it, you've got to have just the exact right timing. As we talked about, Corey Mack mm -hmm. did the other night, and that's hard to do when your front wheels are in the air and the car's sideways and you're out of the groove and you got your hands full. Well, the, the adrenaline takes over at that point, too. You have to realize, you're, you know, you're looking, as you're pedaling it, you're worrying about the other guy. I didn't see him at that point, but as I pedaled it, he pulled up alongside of me, and you're saying, well, you know, unless I get this thing back going, I'm not going to win or have a chance here. So, you, you know, you put the throttle down, and then the next thing, it goes sideways this way, you come off the throttle once again, you go sideways that way, and you almost hit right. the wall, the blower comes off, the rods come out, and, and then you say, oh, we lost. And all this in less than two seconds. Exactly. It gives you just the idea of how much time... Uh, these drivers don't have to react. Well, here's some good news for the fans here at Virginia Raceway Park and all of you at home comfortable and dry in your living room, your den, your garage, wherever you may be. And there's that machine they talked about earlier built by the Penhall, Com Penhall Company in Southern California. It's got a little v high performance V6 engine. It drives a 1471 supercharger in that creek. And boy, it's loud. Boy, it is loud. But of course, if, if anybody has ever been and watched on, an, on a uh, in, or a, a supercharger dyno and watch one of those things run as is in John Force's uh, operation. I have. The noise is just absolutely unbearable. Well, it's the same at the racetrack. You just don't hear it over the uh, the note of the exhaust. But Joe, two wins starting off better than you have in a long time since your last championship season. But then to have two first round losses back to back, that, whew. That's very disappointing, Steve. You know, it definitely... Uh, it's one of them deals where, you know, you think you've got a lot of momentum going and you're going good and then you have two first rounds. We never really got on track at either track, you know, in qualifying. Like, we only make one good run out of four. You don't have a good feel for the track and the, and the, the, the crew chief is struggling a little bit. So it puts you behind the eight ball. You've got to get out there and be able to get down the track two or three times at least to get a feel for race day. And, you know, we're going to have to go to Dallas, which we think is a track more suitable to our horsepower and yep. our combination. Maybe we can run a 320 down there and make a run back at the, the points here and get a... At this point, all we can pray is that Bernstein and Celsi don't get too far ahead and nobody that's right behind us comes up too far and just take the best of the worst. And uh, thank God there's a race in five more days. So, you know, we'll only have five sleepless nights days. instead of ten <laughs> days. Think yeah. about that, guys. It's back-to-back -back this week. Well, that's oh, yeah. another reason uh, that everybody would like to get this race over with today for sure because there is that, uh, it's kind of like the Winston Cup guys. If they're rained out in Talladega, and I think they probably are, their next race is in Sonoma, California next week, and they're faced with even a tougher deal than the drag racers are. But good news is that over the PA, they just said, drivers, please return to your cars. So we're going to get back into top fuel round one. Real quickly, you know, our next pair up is Mike Dunn and Larry Dixon. And, and let's, let's get into the, their head thought right now. You know, what are they thinking? They've had all this delay. We've, they've seen the rain. The track got wet. Now it's cooled I back it. off. It's I not as good as it was after several cars had gone. Joe, where's your, where's your head at when you're uh, in that situation? Well, both of them are probably including the crew chiefs. They may even have backed some changes in the car. They might have gone back, you know, and changed the, the clutch a little bit because the track is definitely, when the rain comes on the track, the rubber buildup, what happens is the rain gets under the rubber a little bit. And then but you don't know if it's going to really stick. Or sometimes you'll even see when you do the burnout, the rubber comes up a little more than normal just because the, the track has uh, got the, 
the rubber and the rain underneath it. Even though they dry at the surface, it's damp and moist underneath there, and the rubber doesn't stick as good. So they're both thinking, well, I better be ready to grab the brake or, or pedal it. I mean, the driver's got a lot of thoughts running through their mind, and they're working hard at just trying to do their job, and we'll see who does the best of the job. Now, I'll tell you what, that's where experience comes in. One of the best at doing the brake job and backpedaling in the whole world is Mike Dunn. He has that tremendous amount of experience, uh, you know, having raced under his father for a number of years. Uh, the advantage that way has got to go to Mike Dunn, but you can't cut out young Larry Dixon because his reaction times are phenomenal. The only thing he has going against him is the inconsistency that Don Perdomo's car has had this year. Okay, let's go to another question from a bit of a ringer. We all know this guy very well. Jerry Reynolds from Hickory Creek, Texas. Hi, Jerry. Thanks for writing in. What car is Mike Edwards driving this weekend, and did they get the Maskins motor they ordered several weeks ago? If they did get it, are they running it? The Schmidt motor or the Morgan motor? Well, who better to go to for an answer than Mike Edwards himself? Yeah, we're running our Oldsmobile from last year. Uh, after the mishap in Atlanta, we're using our car from last year. And uh, the motor program that we're using right now <clears throat> is Larry Morgan. Uh, we've purchased other motors, but uh, we're running the Larry Morgan program right now. Okay, that's the answer to your question, Mr. Reynolds. And let's talk a little bit about some of our upcoming programming with NHRA Winston Championship Drag Racing. And let's talk about this very race itself. Not only are you enjoying it on pay-per-view, also an ESPN2 same-day final round coverage, hopefully, will be tonight at 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Then the highlights of the Pennzoil Nationals, Friday night, May 2nd at 12.30 a.m., uh, replay Tuesday of May 6th at 1 p.m., the Federal Mogul Racing from Richmond will be on ESPN2 May 20th at 8 and replay Wednesday, May 21st at 3.30. So if obviously the same day ESPN2 show tonight is going to determine a lot on or uh, be determined by what happens here with the weather and with the track. But right now it looks like this racetrack is being cleared of all the equipment and rolling into the lanes. Even though we got a little bit of top fuel left comes our first pair of Nitro Funny Cars. <laughs> That's one thing you got to say about NHRA. They really keep after the tracks, and they really work hard to give us a safe track and try and get the races in. You know, five years ago, if we had a rain out or a threat of rain, they would have pulled the plug early. But anymore, they really stick with it, and they try and get the race in, and I give them a lot of credit for that. And you know what, Joe? You can't take too much stock in, let's say, that first pair of cars that goes down the racetrack. They blow the tires off it. Maybe they were too aggressive. You can look at it. But if you, I don't, we saw cars go down with 460s, you know? Yeah, you never know. The, the big thing is the setup. I mean, you know, the guys that seemed like that went down, that ran the 460, probably ran 463 times during the weekend in the qualifying. Yep. And that, that's the difference. They have a feel and a handle for the track, and they're turning the screws the right way to make them fine tunes. And that, that's the difference when you only get one good run, like we did, compared to what, you know, maybe Selzy went down the track three times, I think, in qualifying. So that, that makes a big difference in what you're doing. How's your golf game? Well, the golf game's okay, but <laughs> today we're worrying about the. Today we're worrying about the, the racing game. You know, this gets in your head and you go out and play golf, you don't even ha you're not happy to be there because you're thinking about what happened. It takes me two or three days to recover from the racing. Trust me. When you're out golfing, you're, you're thinking of what, what it could have should have, what you should have done, yep. what you could have done. And, you know, it, it, it's a, that's a mental uh, roller coaster. I remember when Dan Pastorini used to race <laughs> with us. He said, this is worse than the NFL. He said, you know, yep. this racing, he said, you make one good run Friday morning and you're happy. Then you make a bad one Friday night and you don't sleep all night because you're worrying what you're going to do the next day. And it's like up and down, up and down. It's a real mental roller coaster. It uses you up. Well, I'll tell you a guy who may be experiencing some emotions right here during this downtime, and that is Larry Dixon, who was strapped in and ready to race Mike Dunn. Uh, he's down uh, with uh, Bob Unkerfer. That's right. Larry Dixon down here. Mike Dunn sneaking up behind as we speak right now. Mike coming up, giving him a tap on the shoulder. It's going to be a little bit of a driver's race here. Uh, you make any changes back there in the pits on the car? Not at all. We just tried to keep her warm. You know, we didn't want to warm it up again and, uh, you know, change all your clutch settings and everything like that. So, you know, we're just, uh, you know, waiting out the weather. You know, there's a lot of people here today, and we want to get this race off for everyone. So, um, you know, we just got our fingers crossed, hoping we can do it. We're talking in the, as we have been on the pay-per-view program about the inconsistency now in the track. We've seen Selzy go down, lay like, down a good 460, Corey McClendon doing the same thing. We know the track is there. The moisture going to affect anything this time around for you guys? Yeah, it's to be seen. You know, I mean, I think that was a good example of whether it's the Arrow or the Indians. You know, I mean, there's some guys that got a real good handle on things and other ones don't. And, uh, um, you know, I just got my fingers crossed, you know, for everybody on the Miller team here. And, uh, you know, we want to get a win light here. Dunn is 
a bit of a driver, has a little bit more seat time in the car than maybe you do. I uh, think that's going to affect anything here because we are going into a driver's race. Oh, yeah, Mike Dunn's probably one of the best. When I was a kid going out to the races, he was one of the young guys beating up on the older guys. So I used to kind of look up to him as a hero. And, uh, yeah, running him, uh, you got to be on your game, but it's, uh, it's a good measure of your game. Well, the Miller car's been running pretty good this weekend. You guys starting to show some consistency now that maybe was lacking earlier in the year. So the car's there. I know the driver's there. Should be a good, good pair as we get ready to fire up again. Yeah, hopefully it won't end up like the final round in Atlanta last year. Hopefully it's not as uh, exciting as that, but uh, one way or another, we'll put a show on for the fans. I don't know, that final round in Atlanta last year, you got the win. I know, but we, had, we ruined the front tires and the chassis and everything else to get that win light. I don't know if it, it was worth it, because it was the most fun I ever had in a car, ever. Uh, it was just, uh, I don't need that yet. Not today. <laughs> it was an awesome final round. Back up you, Steve. Yeah, and it scared the snake half to death. Dixon stood the car right on its tail. Everybody thought, well, he's beaten. He grabbed the brake, put it down, nailed the throttle, and won the race. Yes, and he did a magnificent job of driving that car. Yeah, bent up the car a little bit. Guess what? Snake didn't care. You know, I started a thought a little earlier that I didn't get to finish, and that top fielder extra chassis, as long as there was no, you know, technological uh, breakthrough or a wheelbase change or them, Joe, those cars had last for a long time. Some of the guys are telling me now that there's magic in new pipe. They may look okay. They just get tired. Well, a good example is Bernstein's car. It's a brand new car. Yesterday he bent it pretty good. Then they put it in the jig and they straightened it. But, you know, once they keep getting them bent, unbent, bent, unbent, plus every time you leave the line, the car torques like this, like this. It's slamming the front end down. The tubing gets war tweaked or warped, yeah. and then it gets a little sag in it. And for some reason, when you put a new car out, it goes right down the track. And last week you were struggling with the same combination in a different car. The trouble is you can't keep buying new cars every week. I mean, number one, it's expensive. What do you do with all the old cars? <laughs> I'll take one. Yeah, really. But, you know, one of the things you got to remember is this thing's got a 1,000-pound motor, and right in front of it, uh, you know, 150, Joe's 170-pound driver. We'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Uh, and all this weight is between 300 inches. So all on tubes, it's only about an inch and a half in diameter. So all this weight is trying to make the car sag just sitting there. So when they accelerate, you'll notice that the cars actually lift up as they're going down the race course. You can almost sometimes look underneath the car. They're bowed so, uh, so properly. If that sag is too much when you start, when it lifts, it doesn't transfer the weight properly to the rear wheels. Guess what? Yeah, the, whole, the whole trick with the car is to have the front wheels off the ground when it leaves. And, and you know, if it doesn't have that balance, it doesn't run the, down the track. Fast. Okay, we're just about uh, ready for take two, round one of Top Fuel here at the Pennzoil Nationals. So let's take a look at what has transpired already in round number one. Gary Selzy just thumped Shelly Anderson. She did the best she could. Kenny Bernstein and an incredible tire smoker got by Pat Dakin. Still to come is Dixon versus Dunn, Amato versus, no, Joe Amato was beaten by Paul Romine. Amato told you about uh, all the problems he had, the car getting totally sideways. Corey McClanathan, another solid 460 performance over Eddie Hill. Scott Coletta with Ed Ace McCullough, twisting the wrenches by Tony Schumacher. Bob Vandegrift Jr. looking strong. Took out Kristen Powell, who did a great job of driving for an 18-year-old kid. Tommy Johnson Jr., he lost to Bruce Sarver, and I'll tell you what, if uh, they can get that Sarver car back to the consistency it's enjoyed, it could be a real, real contender. Okay, now you know what's happened so far. You've met Larry Dixon, who will be up again in the very first race when we get restarted. Let's meet the other half. First of all, Joe Amato, thank you so much thank for joining guys. us. Joe, Okay. great having you up here. Back to the drawing board. See you at Atlanta. Let's go down and meet Mike Dunn with... Bob Umkefer. Well, Mike, we were just talking to Larry about the, the rematch in Atlanta from last year in the final round where uh, you guys were on and off the throttle, and both of you beat up the cars a little bit to get to the win. Unfortunately, Larry got to the stripe first. Well, I'll tell you, you know, he did a great job last year, wheel standing, standing on it, and our car was exploding in the other lane, and, uh, you know, that was a great race. Uh, I got to give it to him. I, we could possibly see more of that today, you know, with, the, with this rain, the track conditions, we may be both out there just fettling our brains out and uh, blowing things up, but hopefully that won't happen. Hopefully we'll get a good clean race and, uh, you know, the best car and best driver will win, but we'll see. You know, they're doing a great job over there, and uh, we're, we're both kind of struggling a little bit, but uh, it's a good matchup. Both of you sons of former drivers, both of you working your way up through other people's cars as we were chatting about off-camera.